tonight we're going to speak about the the bride and the bridegroom and i want to touch on one or two points regarding that uh to open it up a bit for you so that when we next we go but deeper in that that it makes sense for you and that you understand this beauty in the in the gospel about us being the the bride i want to start off by saying not every believer is the bride unfortunately in religion we get taught in the system that we are all the bride and i don't see that in scripture only the true believers that's got a relationship and that is in love with the lord will be his bride the ones that go to church or is religious um that that does it for whatever reason but but not being fully committed to him they will not be his bride i'm not saying they're going to hell that's not what i'm saying there's a difference you get believers that are born again but they don't have a relationship full relationship with the lord they're not going to hell you need to be born again to be saved but the bride must be in love to be, be called the bride you cannot marry someone if you don't love them the foundation to be a bride is love the third room in moses tabernacle is the love room okay so please know there's a qualification to become the bride of christ you need to be totally in love with him committed to him he must be your all in all then you can be his bride that's why the people sitting in the system unfortunately and it's not against them they might not know this but they they're not the bride because unfortunately most of them don't love him they go there because of they have to go to church or they feel they must go to church or whatever the reason maybe they feel they must be in church or they think church is what takes me to heaven because there's a lot of people that believe that that does unfortunately doesn't qualify to be a bride to be a bride you need to be fully in love with the lord then you can go to marriage going to covenant with him remember what i said jesus jesus is coming for a mature bride not for a teenager all right and each of us is mature in a different area where we are if you're still a baby you can be mature as a baby because you're growing doesn't be, mean you have got to be mature let's say somebody gets born again they've got to be mature like me now that's not what i mean i mean where they are at that stage in their life they've got to be growing to maturity in that growth because there's going to be people that's babies when the lord comes and they're also going to be the bride because they are growing towards maturity okay but if you just do the religious thing go to church and all that you're not his bride because you're not you're not in love i've said it before most of the people that i've sat with 99.9 percent .9%, and i'm not exaggerating people that sit with me or with a one-on-one -on -one meeting that comes to see me when i ask them are you in love because they say they believe us when they come to me that's why they come for help and when i ask them do, do you love the lord they can't answer me so most of the people when i ask them are you fully in love with the lord they can't answer me they don't know how to answer me and that's a problem and they and remember these people have told me how good christians they are when they come to see me they tell me what they do in the church they're in the praise and worship band or their worship leader or whatever the case may be. And when I, and I always ask them that one question. Always, I never skip that question because that answers everything for me. Because I don't listen to what they say that much. Because we say whatever we want to say because I know what I want to hear. But that question normally, they pull up the handbrake because they, they're not used to somebody asking them that because that eats a bit home, close to home. So that's what qualifies you to be the bride of Christ. You need to love him so if you listen to this recording and you do not can't answer that question do you love him with your whole being you fully committed with him there's a problem then in your relationship and you need to to work on that because we need there must be love it's so easy to see somebody that's in love with the lord and somebody that's just following him it's a huge difference and that's the same difference between being a bride and just being a believer but we need to be the bride because we want to go to our bridegroom. Okay, so I'm going to explain this a bit more um, as we 
continue tonight. In life as we grow, when we're from a young age or where we are older now, we get programmed to think a certain way. Depending on where you were, how you were brought up or whatever the case may be, your culture plays a huge role in that. That you are brought up in a certain way. What church you attend to plays a huge role. If you were brought up in a certain church, you're going to think that way when you're older. And it might not be the right way. Or vice versa, it doesn't matter. But what, how you were brought up is going to manifest when you get older in what you do and how you think and all that. Sometimes we need to get a reboot because we're thinking and acting according to our culture. And we make our culture, like I said before, our religion. Which is wrong. Same with how, out of what church you were brought up in. And there's nothing wrong with where you were brought up in. But the change when you must grow. So you must change now to think, to think differently. Because you're growing. There was, there was a time and a place where that was fine for you. But now you need to grow out of that. To the next phase the Lord wants to take in. So a lot of us are so programmed when we look at ourselves. 99% of the time. You think negative of yourself. I do that a lot of times and I've got to get my bearings in order, reboot myself again, because I know that's the old way of me thinking, that I'm still working on, on, on refining. But we have got this thing that when we look at ourselves, we always think in a negative way about ourselves. And I want to say this to you, 99% of the time, whatever you think of yourself is not the truth, it's not how the Lord sees you. It's got a totally different outlook towards you. Whatever you think you are, he thinks so much more of you. That's why you must learn. That's whenever I go into that bad place to think negative of myself, because I can go there very quickly, is to look at what does he say? Who am I? That's what I must do. When that helps me to get over the way I think about myself. Okay, so we some of us have that image also depending on where you come from have this image in our in our heads that um, God is just there and he's waiting to whenever you step over the line to, to hit you to give you a hiding to punish you a lot of us have got that sentiment in our in our in our background if I can call it that way how we were brought up and we stick to that and that's the way we think he works with us um, and unfortunately, a lot of us has then got fear in our relationship with the Lord. Because we're so scared we're going to do this and He's going to do this. And if you have fear in your relationship with the Lord, um, you're going to struggle with your relationship. Because it's not truth. I hear so many times when people come to me and they say, listen, I'm going through this or that or whatever, and then they get scared. Fear comes in. And then when the fear comes in, immediately you can hear the way they talk. They're scared of the Lord and how He's going to act and what they're going through. And is He going to be angry with them going through this or whatever the case be? And that's not the case. Yeah, we need to get over the stuff that we're struggling with. We need to get victory in the stuff that we're busy with. But we've got a misconception about how the Lord thinks about us, how He sees us. Okay, so when we are born again, I'm, I've said this before, your spirit becomes one with the Lord. That happens when you are born again. Immediately the Bible says your spirit and the Lord's spirit becomes one. Proverbs says it, um, Proverbs 20 verse 27. Proverbs 20 verse 27. The spirit of man is a lamp of Jehovah, searching all his innermost parts. Look what it's saying here. The Passion Translation says the following. The spirit of God breathed into man is like a living lamp. A shining light searching into the innermost chambers of our being. That lamp. Guess what? We just said, you've got to be what outside? Light. But it says here, the spirit of man is, a, is the lamp of Jehovah. The spirit of man is his lamp. That's deep if you think about it. Very deep. Now, unfortunately, when sin entered... I told you before, the, when sin entered into man in the Garden of Eden, it snuffed out the, lamp, the light, the flame, whatever you want to call it. It snuffed it out. It, it died. 
And that needs to be restored. Sin took that away, that light. Because you don't read about the light in the Old Testament, if you think about it. It's only when Jesus came back, we start reading about the light again. That's coming back. And then now all of a sudden he talks about us in the same sense. All of a sudden we mention in the same things. So all of us have got this longing to, 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 to belong to someone or to something also. Well, Miani always says this thing that, you know, even the people in the Amazon, they will worship something. Whether it's the river, a tree, the mountain, they've never heard about God, any type of God. No white man has ever came to them and said, listen, there's a, 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 a Jesus Christ or somebody came and said, there's a Allah or Buddha. They've never heard any of that. But when they got to them, they were worshipping something in nature. Because there's something in us that needs to belong to and connected to something bigger. That's why every person is in our DNA, is in our nature. We design that way. That's why we've got this emptiness. And when we get born again, that emptiness gets filled by the Lord. And you don't feel that lost anymore. That, that total way of feeling that, you know, you don't know what life is about. You don't know where you're going. That type of thing. So everybody's got that. And it's actually amazing if you think about it. People that never heard about the Lord worship something. Even a freaking tree, they will worship it. But they know inside in them, they must belong to something that's greater than them. Even if it's mother nature, whatever the case may be. And you still get that too today. When I was in India, there was a group that worships nature. Everything in nature, they worship it. Because they must worship something. And that's the, one of the biggest, uh, uh, what do you call it? One of the big, uh, big religious country. But they don't believe in the religious, but they believe in something. Even though they don't follow the mass, they, they do believe in the rivers. They pray in the, for the rivers and stuff. Okay, so we, we've got this thing inside of that we've got to belong. So that's why when we get born again, whatever that dormant place in us, that place that was dormant becomes alive. Because His Spirit comes in and fills us and we, we connect and become one, like I just said. That's why in the Bible, Jesus says... I am the light of the world. Why does he say that? Why does he make a... Again, when you read this stuff, you must ask, why all of a sudden, nowhere was this mentioned in the Old Testament, this like people saying, I'm the light, or this is the light. Or Yeah, Jesus comes and says, I'm the light of this world. Because what is he coming to repair? The light that was snuffed out of us, that when sin came in, he's the one that came, he's coming to repair that. Bring that back to the way it should be when it was like it was in the garden. That's why he calls himself the light. It's a specific reason for him using that terminology. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So we become this one spirit with him. Okay, what I just said. It's 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. And then Paul says in Galatians 2.20. Paul says in Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lived in me. This light, this person that's called the light is living inside of us. So we all got this place in us where he comes and stays. We all got this vacant plot in us where the Lord can come and stay and move in and abide in us. He makes it his home, us, his home. And if you go look in the Bible, how many places in the Bible it says that Christ is in you? There's so many <laughs> verses in the Bible that says that. Go on Esau and just type in Christ in me. You will see how many verses in the New Testament actually states that. It gets emphasized over and over by Paul. Christ is in you. Because there's something important that we need to realize. All right. Now we as people are not just a spirit. We just spoke about the spirit becoming one when we get born again. We also got a soul. A seal. A soul. Okay? And it's in the soul dimension where we have the problems. We've spoken about it previously. Because our programming has gone wrong there. Because of the way we were brought up or our culture we were brought up. That's where the problems comes in. It's in your soul dimension. Your seal. And that's why I said in the beginning, your bridegroom looks at you very differently than what you look at yourself. He's got a total different outlook to who you are and what he sees in you, your qualities he sees in you. 
than what you see in yourself. In Song of uh, Solomon, it says in Psalm uh, 7 6, How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights. I'm going to read another translation. I want you to hear what I'm saying here now. It's him talking to his bride, you. Oh, how beautiful you are. How pleasing, my love. How full of delights. I'm going to read another translation. I want this to sink in. He's saying this about you as he's sitting here. How beautiful and how delightful you are. My love with all your charms. Who's thought that about yourself lately? Hmm? We don't. We always look at the negative. I do that too. But then I've got to remind myself not to go there. This is what he is saying here. And that's why he, the book of Song of Solomon's, don't read it in the physical, in the natural, husband and wife. Yeah, you can, there's things in there that will help you if you read it that way. But it's a book about the bride and the bridegroom, which is the Lord Jesus Christ in you. That's what that book's about. There's so many deep, deep things, and I'm not going to go anywhere deep tonight. But there's so many deep things in that book. If you realize what that book's about, it's how your bridegroom feels about his bride and what he's saying about his bride and what should the bride be doing and what should she think about the bridegroom. So I haven't got a problem with people teach out of Song of Solomon's um, in the natural. For there's, there's a place for that, but that's not what it's about. It's way deeper than that. All right. So remember now, I mean, in this that I just read to you, you can actually see how he longs for you. He's got this longing for you in that that he says there. You delight him. He loves you. He sees you as this lovable person that he wants, wants you. Because why does he want you? Because he's also got the same thing that we need to qualify for a marriage. He loves you. That's why we must also love him so that the two can become one. He already loves us. And he, that's what it's saying there. He's saying it there. So, remember, your soul, I've said this before, just want to recap, and I'm probably going to say it a lot, a lot of other times as well, because we tend to forget this stuff. Your soul is the bride. Your soul is the bride. And your spirit, and, and in your spirit lives the bridegroom. You got that all. Your soul is the bride the bridegroom is staying in your spirit because your spirit and his spirit becomes one so he moves in christ in you the hope of glory your bridegroom moves in in your spirit but your soul like i said there is a bit of problems that needs to be sorted out that's why we get the holy spirit to come and help us there and I don't want to remember i don't want to i've said it before don't make your soul as this bad negative thing that's not what it's about the Lord doesn't see it as a bad negative thing. He sees it as something that He wants to help us and that we must grow in and, and, and conquer to become pure. Uh, again, Song of Solomon's one fifteen. We're going to read you another verse. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove eyes. Do you see how you can't read this book in the natural? Dove eyes. I mean, what does that mean? If you read it in the natural, if you don't go into the spiritual stuff, and I'm not going to go into that stuff now, I just want to show you how we can not read this book in the natural. I mean, I don't think Lydia's going to like when I say you've got dove eyes. If she doesn't know what I mean by that. I mean, there's places where it says you're like a little deer jumping up and down. If you say, if you say that to your wife, or your wife, she's not going to understand it because it's got spiritual meaning, that stuff. All right? Um, but he speaks, I mean, when you look at this, he speaks right into your spirit. Listen to what he's saying there. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove eyes. Dove is gentle, lovable. The main thing about a, the, a dove, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, is love. Love. The Holy Spirit's whole essence, his whole being is love. And that's what he sees in your eyes. 
we knew the bride. So, whenever you think about your soul, that that you always have been going into the negative, and it's good to go sometimes to the negative because there's stuff that needs to be sorted out there. That's why we go there. But when he looks at that soul of yours, you must realize that's his bride. Now, in the book of Song of Solomon's, I said here, there's five places where he calls him dearly beloved of my soul. There's five places in the book of Song of Solomon's where he calls you dearly beloved of my soul. That's deep. That's what he thinks about you. Do you see how that clashes with what we sometimes in certain religious groups were taught, especially the way I was brought up? And what I didn't get this type of teachings in the, the denomination where I grew up, I always heard the negative stuff, angry, you know, every Sunday you get a hiding. Because we don't understand this. But this is, I mean, five times he says, dearly beloved of my soul. Um, when he said Pentecostals, when they started, the focus was on the soul a lot. And the Pentecostal churches started way back. He always said uh, that was one of the big focus points was the soul. Okay. They focused a lot on soul. But over the years that faded away and they became focused on the spirit. They moved to the spirit side, which wasn't there in the beginning. It's actually, and then they start not teaching on that when they're more focused on the spirit. That's why they drifted slowly away from the truth. There's reasons why the church went that route with the spirit. And it sounds good, but in essence, it wasn't good why they went that way. But in the beginning, I mean, you all know, they've, they've always spoke about, um, like most of the time you would hear in the church, they said, your soul is saved. This, this, type, this type of stuff that you would hear in the church, your soul needs to be saved, or you save, your soul gets saved. They all had that in their, in their DNA in the beginning when they started the, 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 the religious systems. But unfortunately today, the one not gives you hiding the whole time, the other just focus on the spirit. Both has got a place, but they miss it. There's, there's something missing in that. Now, the manifestation of the Lord is not possible in us if the, the soul is not restored. I'm going to repeat this. The manifestation of the Lord is not possible in us if the soul is not fully restored. That's why I don't like when people say we are already sons of God or we are already mature sons. A lot of people today is getting more and more saying we sons. There was only one son. Because if you, if you tell that to a, to a baby Christian, they don't understand the difference. There's people that believe outside that each one is going to be manifested in his own time, according to the way he grows. Listen to what I'm saying. There's people outside that believes you're going to manifest Jesus Christ when you become mature in your own time. I don't believe that. I don't see that in the Bible. Every time when the Lord moved in the Bible, he did it at once with everybody that he was doing it with. Not one at a time. The Holy Spirit wasn't poured over to just this one. And then there's just this one, uh, two days later, and then five months later to this one, when the movement starts, when this thing starts. The Lord always does not suddenly, but everybody that's got to go in this thing, that's ready for this thing. So when the Lord's going to move again, it's going to happen with everyone that's his bride in one moment, in a blink of the eye, it's going to happen. Not to how you grow, because then you're going to feel more, mature than the other guy because you're going to be mature before that person i hope you see the problem there and it's not biblical i'm sorry it's not biblical anybody can take me on on that but it's not biblical and there's a lot of people that believe in this okay so that's why i said the manifestation manifestation of the lord is not possible in us if your soul is not restored if you're not busy with this restoration of your soul, this the bride, she needed to be cleansed to become pure, to marry to the pure, pure bridegroom. All right. So, Song of Solomon's seven, verse seven. I'm going to read seven, eight, and nine. 
This thy stature is like to a palm tree, and thy breasts to clusters of grape. I said I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of the bows thereof. Now also the breast shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples. Can you see why you can't read this literally? If I tell Lydia her nose smells like apples. <laughs> it's not going to work. And the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved. Look what he's saying here. And the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved. That goeth down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. There's so much in those things. I'll, I think if you have to go into that, it's going to take you a year just to do those three verses I've just said in the Spirit. But I want to see how he's talking spiritually here, everything that he's mentioning here. Um, do you understand if you listen to those three verses I just read, and there's plenty of them in Song of Solomon's, why you need to be in a, in a, a romantic relationship with the Lord? Because that's the way he speaks. And if you say this to religious people, they go, ooh, because they don't understand relationship, intimacy. But he uses that terminology throughout the whole Bible. We've got to be intimate with him. See how intimate he speaks to us. I mean, he calls a, a woman's breasts, I'm sorry, ladies, but it's here, breasts, clusters of grapes. There's deep meaning in that. What is grapes? And when does, what process does grapes go through? Because grapes can um, shiver away, uh, go, go old. But if you put grapes through a process, it becomes wine. There's a lot to this. What does bread stand for? Nourishment. One day we'll talk more when we get to that, but it, it, it's... It's not in the natural. So please, we need to be in a romantic relationship with the Lord. But unfortunately, most people are in a religious relationship with the Lord. <coughs> they don't understand to be intimate, romantic with the Lord. They don't, they've got no way of understanding because they were never taught that in their culture or in the religion they were brought up in. And that's why they don't know. They don't know this stuff. And we find fault with ourselves because we don't know what the, our bridegroom thinks of you. There's a big difference between having a relationship with the Lord and being a religious relationship with the Lord. The one is life and the other one is death. All right. And again, not speaking about hell and heaven. It's got nothing to do with that. All right. Uh, where was I? Again, also, let me just say this. I've said it before but for the people that's listening. Us as men struggle with this concept of being a bride. It's a difficult concept for us to grasp. How can I be a bride and some man is going to marry me? But remember what I said? Our soul is feminine. Whenever you look into the Greek and the Hebrew meanings when they speak about the soul, it's written feminine. In a female way. Your spirit is man. Because he's staying there. Your bridegroom. But your soul. Which is going to come and marry one day. It's not your body that he's going to come and marry. Is female. That's why us as men can relax. <coughs> he's coming to marry that thing that he calls his beloved. The thing he made. Perfectly. That's his beloved. Thou art fair. He's speaking about your soul, which is madly in love with. All right, you understand that. So, we as men don't have to really, if you, if you get that, it makes it way more easier to sit back and say, okay, Lord, do what you want to do. I'm your bride. Okay. So, all right, so, because we were not brought up to think in that way. We were brought up in such wrong ways. So that's why sometimes it's difficult to relate to the Lord, especially with the relationship of stuff as men, because we have got the wrong concept of what's going on here. Okay. 
Look at what verse says, uh, 10 is saying in, in, in Song of Solomon 7. I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. Does it say his desire is to punish me? Like I was brought up to believe when I was still young. It says here, his desire is towards me. I am my beloved's. That's why in a natural, that's what a, 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 a wife should think of her husband. I'm his. He adores only me in the natural and so much more with the Lord. So much more. Do you see why you can't teach this to a baby Christian? Because their heads will spin. Because they will not have full understanding of what's going on here. Because it's, it, you need to be somewhere to understand this. In your, in your spiritual growth. So, let's talk about virginity. In Afrikaans, maagdelikheid. We know the only thing that can save mankind, where we now in this dark time, in, in where we're walking into now, the only, only thing that can save us as human beings is the manifestation of His glory, Jesus Christ, that can bring Correction, freedom in this whole world. No political party, no laws brought in. Can, they can only control things up to a certain way. They can't take away the bad. They can't. It's not possible. Man cannot cure what's going on in the world. In, with wars, illness, diseases. We cannot. We try and contain it and control it. But we can't. It's only the Lord that can come and get rid of everything. So we need to know. We accept what we're struggling in, but we need to know that's the ultimate. He's the one that's going to come and repair everything. The whole of nature is going to come and repair. So for him to come and do that, to come to that place where he can come and do that, he first needs to come to us as he's as his bride. He's going to come to us, he stays in us, and he cleanses us. But the manifestation of the Son of God in us as believers, okay, as true believers that's in love with him, the manifestation of that um, can only happen in an atmosphere of purity. Virgin. Pure. That's why I always say we've got to get over our junk. And we've got the best one to help us. He's called the Holy Spirit. So we stop with our stuff that we're struggling with. Because it's always got to take place in a place of purity. We'll talk about that a bit more now. Let's look at Luke 1. Where we read about this, a virgin. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay? We continue. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favoured. This virgin, this bride-to-be, is called highly favoured. What did I say the Lord saying about you? When we read in Song of Solomons, my beloved of fair, he says, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Remember, I taught you what is the meaning of woman. We might talk about it again. It's religion, the whore, or it's the bride. It's one of the two. Okay. He's, she's blessed around the, amongst women that talking about the bride. Okay. Do you see when, when the angel came to say what the Lord is saying to, to Mary here, he immediately validates <coughs> her, confirms her, lifts her up. Doesn't break her down or anything negative. He lifts her up and validates her as a woman, who she is, and what she's capable of doing and why he's there. He doesn't humiliate, humiliate or embarrass or anything like that. Eh? Like we do today when, when somebody gets married, we, we have these parties. Eh? To humiliate that guy getting married in the, in the, in the, 
the wife to be we, we have these parties to humiliate them in the streets like that you see how we miss it it's not how it's supposed to be verse 29 and when he's, she saw him she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of solution this should be and the angel said unto her fear not mary for thou hast found favor with god all right she's found favor grace with god as i say Again, the message of becoming a son of God, sonship, is a message of grace. That's what we stand in. We don't make grace a teaching. It's in what we stand. It's not a teaching. So, 2,000 years ago, when, that's what we're reading here. 2,000 years ago, he worked, the Lord worked through a virgin, Mary. Today, He's still got the same plan. But this time it's going to be a group of virgins he's going to work through. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing in you. He's getting you to become pure. All right. You see how you can't read this stuff in the natural because then we all miss it. If that happens, then the glory will be restored in mankind, in humanity. Sin will be gone then. And only light will come in, which is Jesus. Of course, you also the light, because he stays in you, which is the light, which was taken out in the beginning. Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son. What are we waiting for? The maturity of the sons of God. She's bringing forth a son. And shalt call him his name Jesus. And what name are you going to stand? Because it's not in the name Jesus. In what it's what did I teach you? What does the name mean in the Bible? Authority. What the name means, not the saying the name. Because in religion you were taught to say the name. It's not to say the name. It's to believe what the name, who the name is, and what it's capable of doing. And that's what it means. You're going to stand in that same name, the meaning of the name, the power, the what that name means, not in Jesus' name just by saying it. It's not a a one that you use that word all right he shall be great and shall be called the son of the high and the lord god shall give unto him the throne of his father david and he shall reign over the house of jacob forever and his kingdom kingdom there shall be no end now listen to what mary says then said mary unto the angel how shall this be seeing i know not a man in other words, she hasn't slept with anybody. She's still a virgin. And you know what? She's correct. Because what happened with her, no man can do that. To impregnate her with the Christ. Guess what? No man can impregnate us also today. Who impregnated us? The Christ is staying inside of us. The Holy Spirit. Who impregnated Mary? the Holy Spirit. We also have this baby called Christ inside of us, which is grown that we were, that was brought forth through the Holy Spirit. You see, we're going through the same thing that Mary has gone through. Know it, know it. You've got to live this stuff. You're not just going to know it here. You've got to live this because this is revelation stuff that you can live with. Um, where was I? Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I just thought of this when I read this. Now. I haven't thought of it before. So what is it actually saying there is, the day when you become born again, your spirit and the Lord's spirit becomes one. So realize this, that that moment when that happens, and when the people pray for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to activate the Holy Spirit in you, more accurate way of saying it, it's actually when you get impregnated. Have you ever thought of that? I've never thought of it that way. I know it, but I've never thought of it that, that that's what happened in that moment. The Holy Spirit comes in you, and what does He do? He impregnates you. I just thought of it when I read this now. 
Understand what I'm saying. The day when somebody prayed for you, for instance, and the Holy Spirit was activated in you, a seed was planted in you through the Holy Spirit, which is Christ, and you became pregnant with Christ. He stays inside of you all of a sudden, and He's growing as you are growing, because He's going to marry you one day. He's going to manifest through you one day. Okay, let's look at what Paul is saying. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have imposed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Chaste, pure, virgin to Christ. Paul is saying it. I've said to you guys, that's what discipleship's about. It's to take somebody by the hand, teach them the basics, take them deeper, and then release them as a chaste virgin to walk with their bridegroom. Not to hold on to them for 20 years. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about teaching somebody so they can walk with their bridegroom. You can only get the person and help them to go to that place of maturity and purity through what you have walked so that they can become this, like he says there, this chaste virgin for Christ. Everybody you disciple, you must try and get there and let them go to go meet their bridegroom. They cannot meet him when they're still a baby. They're not ready yet. That's why you help them. You're their mother and father, guiding them in their process in this in this growth. But your end goal is to get everybody that you disciple to become a chaste virgin. That's why I'm doing this Bible school with you. I want you to become that. That's why I keep on saying you've got to do everything I'm teaching here outside because that's what's going to happen with you. Because he's looking for this pure bride. I wrote you something that Umiani, I wrote down a quote that Umiani said. It was not a quote, it's something that he told us that he, the Lord told him. As long as a baby is in the mother's womb, the umbilical cord will feed the baby and it stays a baby. The baby can only grow and become mature if the baby is born. The umbilical cord is cut and the feeding method changes. Think about it. Think about what we say about milk and meat. This is just with the baby. The method of, of eating, feeding has got to change for the growth to take place. The umbilical cord is good for a time and a place. And then it must be cut. You cannot feed by that anymore. Otherwise it stays a, a baby. Unfortunately, religion today, and it's not about talking negative about the church, it's showing what's right and wrong. We love the people in the church. But the problem we have there is, unfortunately, a lot of them are under such control of leaders, pastors, dominies, reverends, whatever you want to call it. What they are doing is they're keeping the umbilical cord connected to the people, to the babies. They're not growing, they're staying babies. Everybody stays connected to this way of being fed through whoever standing there. That's why I said if this virus is happening now, the people that used to be fed that way are going to suffer. Because now they can't go to this one where they're connected to the, with the umbilical cord. They're going to suffer and they're going to die because they can't they haven't moved on. The umbilical cord hasn't been cut. And unfortunately, we have a lot of these baby centers eh? that feeds the babies. Most of them are doing that. Not all of them, but a lot. Most of them are doing that. People are so tied to certain pastors and, and denominations with this umbilical cord. They're so tied and they don't realize it. How they're tied to, connected to this. But it, unfortunately, keeps those people in the the leaders have got power over their people because they're connected to him but if we say they will do even if it's wrong stuff they will still do they don't even realize it a lot of times 
what's going on. We spoke about it recently about how many, just in this country, people have gone massive leaders in, in, in churches and groups or whatever. Just in this last six, seven months, have, we, we see it's gone the wrong way. Stuff is coming out that's wrong. I mean, huge, massive leaders in our country in, re in religious circles. But we connect with the umbilical cord to them. See, why can't you be connected? You can't even be connected to me. Please, don't be connected to me. I've said this from day one when we started here. This is something Umiani taught me. And I've stood by that. And you all know that's been with me for years. I've always said you're not connected to me in any way. You're connected to the Lord. You don't belong to me. I'm here to teach and help you. But you're not connected to me. You're connected only to one person. That's Christ. You don't belong to me, and I don't belong to you. We all are his bride. That's why religion are going the way they're going, because they connect one another and they worship the pastors and the leaders. It's not the right way to do it. It's not. You don't tie yourself to anybody, any man. In discipleship, somebody will guide you for a time and a period and you will grow deeper after that in, in going in your relationship. But at the end of the day, it's you and the Lord. Remember what we said, the three questions we had with Peter last week? The agape. In some of the translations, the third one he said, um, what's it in the standard version or whatever, it says it so beautifully. I didn't read that last time, but you, I said you guys can go read it on your own. But it says that the last one, let my sheep uh, graze. Remember that the first one is feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Then some translations say again feed my sheep. But some translations say let my sheep graze. In other words, let them go. And I said to you, it's the same as discipleship. First you get the baby lamb and you help them. Then you go deeper with them when you start feeding them. And then you get to the place where you let them go. And they can eat on their own. All right. So, if I don't let you go, if a pastor or a leader don't let you go, he cannot present you as a chaste virgin because you're connected to someone else. Then you're not a virgin in the spirit. Do you understand that? If you're connected to me, connected to me, then I can't present you as a chaste virgin. You need to be pure on your own. For the bridegroom. You cannot be connected to me. Or to any person or any denomination. You cannot. I'm sorry. So. Remember we're talking about this, the bride. According to the soul. Uh, that it's an image and a type of the soul. It also says that. The, we are like a palm tree. And there's a lot of meaning. Towards a palm tree. We are like palm trees. Does he say we are. We are willow tree, uh, acorn, what is it, what trees are there? Yeah, any tree. He uses a specific tree, a palm tree. This one right outside here. Do you see side branches on that tree? Do we get sidetracked very quickly when we hear stuff? Are we supposed to? No. Where's the fruit of that tree? On the top. That's the tallest tree in this whole street. Why doesn't it blow over? Because it's rooted. So well, one day maybe we'll talk about that more. There's so much to say about that. But he uses a specific tree because it means something. It says a lot. We're talking about maturity, that tree, that type of tree. Let's look at what John is saying in Revelation 14 verse 1. Revelation 14 verse 1. We've got to move. And I look and lo, a lamb stood... On the Mount Zion, Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, I'm not going to go into the one four four year now. Okay, hundred forty four thousand. In the King James, it just says hundred forty and four thousand. Some translation would just say hundred forty. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, the deep meaning about that now. It's not what you think the church have taught you. Please, it's a spiritual thing then. It's not a physical number. Alright? I'm just going to say now, but 
the thing I want to emphasize here, it says they having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, please, you're not going to have the name Jesus Christ carved into your forehead. Like the mark of the beast or whatever carved in your forehead. Your, what is it here? Your mind. What is, does the Bible say you have to, got to, have, have to have here? The mind of Christ. That's what's going to be in this palm tree. And the bride, the mind of Christ. It's not written G E S U S E on your forehead in that in the natural. You need your it means your mind's going to be replaced with the mind of Christ. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which also which also which was also in Christ Jesus. That mind he's talking about. Um, in our region here, we don't have a lot of people teaching about sonship or kingdom we don't have a lot of teachers here i know hartenbos has got a church i can remember way back I had a church i've never been there that it's got a bit of that going but again yeah let's not all to say anything but i've heard about that but i've been to so many places where like, you know, seminars, teachings, whatever places that you go to. And they all have one thing in common. Most of them, let me rather just say most of them, not to offend. Most of them have got one thing in common when I go to these things. And I'm talking now about kingdom, sonship, all of that stuff. I'm not talking about churches. Most of them got one thing in common. It's arrogance and pride. Unfortunately, a lot of them has got those things going. Arrogance and pride. They think they know better. They, they mock the ones that don't know what they know. They just see themselves as up there and the rest is shame down here. Uh, do you know what identifies a true son of God? Humbleness. I've said this before. It's not the first time I'm saying this. I've seen people that I know that think they're going deeper and all of a sudden there's pride. You don't see the Lord Jesus in them. They talk about Him. They use Him. They teach about Him. But I don't see Him. There's no humbleness. It's just pride and arrogance. And I also in the beginning didn't see that it really took the Lord to hit me with a huge bat to see that. Because I didn't in the beginning see it. But it was like, when I saw it, I was like, how did I never see this? When I go to these things and I don't see... I'm not saying what they're saying is bad. I'm talking about where they are. Humbleness, humbleness, humbleness. Philippians 2 verse 6. Philippians 2 verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation... How many of these people that I've gone to have got huge reputations? No reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name again authority what a name is standing for not t-e-s-u-s -S, it's what it stands for it's given him a name which is above every name that at the name of jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father what is the character Characteristic of such a person. It explains it there in such a beautiful way there. It's humbleness. It says they you see what is not robbery to become a servant, to serve. Jesus washed the feet. His feet wasn't washed. He washed the feet. If we look at some teachers today standing in the front in the sonship spiritual stuff, even in the Pentecostal circles, in some Pentecostals that are doing certain teachings. I struggle to see humbleness in them. 
they've got this title, this name, this aura all around them. I don't see humbleness. I don't see Jesus. And I cannot listen to somebody, even if their teachings is beautiful, if I don't see Jesus. I can't. There was a time I did that, but luckily the Lord came and helped me with that. I grew out of that. That 144,000, <coughs> if you want to write this down, I'm just going to, I'm not going to explain anything now, but it speaks, it's, it's to speak about, it's talking about a seed that was planted in the earth. Okay, one day we'll maybe talk about that. It's a seed, more seed. It's not an exact amount. 144,000 people are going to get saved, like the Jehovah Witnesses believe. It's talking about a seed that's planted in the earth. One day we'll get to that. And Zion, it's a church of Jesus Christ. The meaning of that. Okay? I'm not going to go into that now. Revelations 14 verse 4. These are they which, listen to what I'm saying. These are they which were not defiled with women. Remember what I said about women? For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Remember we spoke about, I specifically taught you about the Lamb before. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Again, a woman in the Bible, it's a religion, church, or bride. Yeah, we said that. It's always in a female. The spirit of every person is male. I said that earlier. Unfortunately, if you look at today, what did I say? One is one of the big problems today. We spoke about it in the world. Feminism. It's one of the big growing concerns in the whole world, which is pushing the whole world in a certain direction. It's feminism. And again, the soul. The soul. What is causing men to take part in women sports today? Feminism pushed that agenda. They stood behind pushing that men can take part in women's sport today. It's all feminism. Your soul. What gives a, a woman security at her house? A couple is married. What gives a woman security? You know, hus husband takes, truly takes his role as a priest, a prophet, and a king. Not his title, his role. And all those things, if you look at the meaning of those words that I said, priest, prophet, and king, they serve. Priest was one of the biggest servants for the <coughs> Lord. They didn't sit and rule. A king, a true king doesn't sit and rule. A true king listens to his advisors. And rules according to that. What the people are wanting and saying. He doesn't dictate. The bad king dictates what he wants. That gives a woman security in a house. If her husband acts according to that. So. Luckily our heavenly bridegroom. He's doing exactly that in you. He's playing the role of a priest, prophet and king in you. In your spirit. That's what he's busy doing with you. He knows the correct way of playing that role in you and me. When he's busy with it. So, remember, it says there, these are they which were not defiled with women. Now, please, if you read this in the natural, you're going to think, okay, I didn't sleep around, so I'm okay. I didn't defile myself with women. But it's a spiritual thing there. It actually says there, these are they which were not defiled with religion. You see why I'm telling you not to go into religion? Stay away from teachings that are not from God. Because then you're defiling yourself with the whore. And it's hard to say that, but that is what it is. That's what it's saying there. These are the people that doesn't get stuck and defiled by religion. They are the virgins. They're staying, with other words, pure. They're not allowing this religious spirit to impregnate them. We spoke about it the other day. Because you get impregnated by the religious spirit as well. And then carrying this religious child, which you're going to give birth to one day. And it's not going to be Jesus Christ. That's why we must stay out of the systems. Because we need to be pure. It says there, These are they which are not defiled with women, with religion, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb. 
Who follows the lamb? Religious people, the woman. No. The virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he should go. These were, these were redeemed from among men. They were, we, we are redeemed by Christ to be this virgin. He did it, not you. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Okay. Something that Monique and myself spoke about this, this, this afternoon. Listen to her this year. She, she played a song and she said she heard this in the song. And I said to her, listen to this verse I just read here when you came in and spoke about the song. I said to her, when we do something, let's first put it this way. Jesus assists us in our soul. He helps us in your soul. This woman inside of us. The female but inside of us. He speaks prophetically. He speaks through the word to us. When you read your Bible, when you pray, when He speaks to you. He speaks to you from the Father into your soul. To make you fall in love with Him. To, to get you to that place of purity. That's how He speaks. So when you get angry, when you lose it, like we sometimes do in everyday life outside there, he doesn't give you a hiding like you think when you do that. And the song that she showed me was actually singing about that. He pleads your case to Father when you go that way. Your bridegroom pleads your case to Father and say to Father, Father, don't worry, this woman has just lost it. Your soul. Forgive her. Like we men have got to say a lot of times. Huh? When the, the ladies go off in a certain way, we also just, just, just forgive them. We'll just forgive them for where they're going off now. The Lord does the same thing for you and me. When our woman, our soul, goes off in a tantrum in this way, like we women can do, Jesus comes up and steps up and says, Lord, don't worry, I've got this. I've got her. That's what he does. He doesn't go and say, what did you do now? He doesn't do that. Because remember, now you're becoming a bride. You're not a baby anymore. A baby gets a hiding when they're naughty. Not when you're mature. All right? He doesn't stand with the rod wanting to, to give you a hiding. He just pleads your case in front of the Lord. She's a bit upset. Lord, forgive her. I'll, I'll sort her out now. Holy Spirit, go do your thing. Go help. And he comes and he helps you to get over that thing or see correction or whatever the case may be. But as a king inside of you, priest, prophet and king, he comes and he rules in you. And when he rules, there's joy. You can look at the Bible. If you're under his rulership, you listen to his rulership, you will have joy and peace. All right. It says there, for they are virgins. All right. So. Allow your soul to become entwined with the Lord and not the world. That's why I said the stuff in the beginning about the virus and everything, the way we think. Don't think like the world. In the world, you don't find a lot of virgins because people think they can sleep around. You've got to think differently. Be pure. All right? That's why I'm very picky to who I listen to, where I go these days. When it comes to people and teachings. Because I want to be a pure bride. I don't go anywhere. And I'm not saying you can't go anywhere. There is people that the Lord uses. But I'm just saying to you. Be very careful. Especially if you're still young in the walk. If you don't know people yet. Be very careful who can impregnate you. Be very careful. And I'm not saying we're better than the other people. That's not what I'm saying. Just... We walk in the truth, all right? We, we all love the people, like I always say, fathers, children, we all love them. But I don't identify with what they are doing. That we don't do. We don't identify. If a child's playing there, I don't go play with them. I'm more mature now. All right? I will only play with the child if I want to win them over or teach them something. But I'm not going to play with them for fun the whole time because that is not fun for me anymore. All right? We've spoken about this before. So, so protect your souls. Your virgin. Protect her. That you, that you are this, this virgin. Your spirit is precious for the Lord. I mean I've read you those verses in the beginning. Your, 
your soul is precious. Your spirit, when you stayed, it's already made precious when he became, came into you. Your soul is so, so precious for him. Know that, then you will protect that. Then you will not go to anything, listen to anything, go to any religious church, or what the case may be, whatever. And again, I'm not saying all churches are bad. You know what I mean. You will protect your soul, because you don't want it to be impregnated with the wrong things. Psalm 23, verse 1. We all know this. Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. What does He restore? Your soul. Who've read that in this? In this? Because we read so, we know this thing by, by heart, this, this passage, this psalm. But we don't always look at what we're reading there. He says, He restores my soul. That's what he's busy with. He leadeth me into the path of righteousness for his name's sake again, what it stands for. James 1 verse 21. I'm going fast now. James 1 verse 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the encrafted graved word which is able to save your soul. It saves your so, you can go to all the translations. I use more than one when I read this stuff. Go through a couple of translations when you read. I'm not going to read every time all the translations I have. Otherwise, we're going to sit here forever. But go and read the different translations. Some say it so beautifully. And they all have the same truth, most of them. But it's just to make it more relevant and beautiful for you when you read different translations because of the wordings they use. Receive the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It says in verse 9, 1 Peter 1 verse 19. Receive the end of your faith. What is the end of your and my faith? The salvation of your soul. That's what happens. Restoration. Salvation is restoration. The restoration of your salvation of your soul. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Remember what I said when we read that verse now? These are they which follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It doesn't say, um, these are they that follow Pastor Jan, or Pastor Kuis, or Pastor this, or Pastor that. It says, these are they that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Okay, we spoke about it. Now, again, I remember last time I, I gave the men a bit of hiding with some of the stuff I said. Now, ladies, it's your turn to get a bit of a hiding, not our men's turn. Unfortunately, you ladies are very open to lend out your ears and your eyes to religious stuff. It's in your nature to, to, to share things. Little verse of the day. Or a little picture with a little verse in it. Or do you see us as men do that? <laughs> Obviously, there's going to be guys. I'm talking about majority men, majority women. You will find majority men don't do that. Who's on a family WhatsApp group? Most of the family WhatsApp group. Who's the one speaking on that group 99% of the time? The men or the women? You were made that way. Unfortunately, you just use it sometimes in a very wrong way. But you you guys are so easily to, to follow stuff that you read and you want to share how you love to share these, these pastors on Facebook. Oh, they say this little thing and then you, this little video clip and you share it on Facebook. And you, then you don't know who that pastor is or what they're doing. But this one thing sounds so beautiful. Let's just share it. You do that. I see that. You will not find a lot of men do that. So, I mean, just look at the, the motivational stuff and the, the little Bible verses you share. Man, it's, it's, it's hectic. That stuff we do, again, but it's, it's those little things that we should not do. It keeps us busy, but it's not what it's about. Focus. I'm going to use another example. Let's go something totally different. Jewish, Judaism. Let's use that as an example. Again, listen to what I'm saying. I've got nothing against Jews. I've said this before. I've got nothing against Jews. But what I'm seeing is happening in the moment in the church is becoming a problem. 
people are becoming falling into Judaism. It's creeping in everywhere in the church. Slowly it came in. But I can see it's happening more and more. 2,000 years ago, who crucified Jesus Christ? Jews. Okay? Out of their beliefs and the way they were brought up, they crucified. Not, the Romans didn't crucify Jesus Christ. They did the action. But the ones that brought him to the place of crucifixion was the Jews. Okay? Again, I'm saying I'm not against Jews, but the things that we bring into the into the church today, we, we, we don't tend to see what's going on. We bring all this stuff in that was actually part of the problem in the beginning. We bring it into the system again, into the church system, into religious circles today. They, it's as if this thing was slowly infiltrating the church. And it's now like accepted. All right. going to give you some examples and again there's nothing wrong if you want to get some of this stuff if you're in a relationship with the job with the with the lord if you're in a relationship and you want to get this stuff it's fine but a lot of us are not in a relationship we just want to get the stuff do the stuff and that i've got a problem with it's stuff like the way you wear your hair i see i've seen that men start growing the hair and beards in a certain way jewish culture way not having long hair the way they do it the beards if you look at most people that's into anything Jewish today, the men are growing their beards. Why? Because they want to look a certain way. Because they are starting to act a certain way. Um, I wrote here, clothes they wear. Prayer mattresses we use. Talits. There's nothing wrong with that. I would also want to use a talit if I have one. But they're using it not for in a relationship. They're using it in this religious ways. The stuff. Even the Sabbath. I'm not going to explain this now. How they see the Sabbath and how they are religiously stuck to the Sabbath. But there's no relationship. Festivals. They are so religiously starting to keep more and more people in the church are starting to, be, to do the festivals. And I said to you, there's nothing wrong with doing the festivals. If you have a relationship with the Lord. But if it's a law you must do it. That's not right. I'm sorry you're bringing all these Jewish cultures into, into the body of Christ. That culture crucified Christ. And I'm not talking against the culture of Judaism. I'm talking about the beliefs around it. That we are bringing into the church. is the stuff that was standing against Christ. The law stuff that was against Christ. That crucified him. We bring that back into the church. All the stuff, the laws, we bring him back into the church. Christ was crucified because he did stuff that was outside the law. He healed people on the Sabbath. And he got crucified for that. All right. If we look at the Reformed Church, the Pentecostal Church, they're all doing this stuff, certain stuff that, uh, that are not biblically. They're bringing stuff in and inventions and stuff that they're bringing into the, into the church. It's not there. I mean, even if you look at the, uh, with the, the Jewish stuff, how many Jewish things do you see get sold today? Plates. Stuff you hang on the wall with a little Hebrew writing on it. Nothing wrong with it if you're in a relationship, but the people are starting to, to grow this culture of Jewish stuff in the house and putting Jewish stuff everywhere. You, you must get, it must come from the right place. It mustn't come from religion. To act more like a Jew. Grow your beard. I'm using silly stuff here, but I want you to see why I'm saying this. Which is creeping into the body of Christ. The stuff is creeping in and the people aren't seeing, they're embracing this stuff. Because they don't see what's going on. I mean, these days, it's one of the big things they're saying you should know. You must find out your Jewish roots. Where do you find that verse in the Bible? It's one of the big things they're saying now. Find your Jewish roots. See if you've got, I mean, and it's in mainstream churches, it's okay to say that now these days. It's acceptable. Men are getting circumcised because it's a sign of the covenant today. Bringing those Jewish things into the church.
like I said, I don't always, I don't get angry with this stuff. It just makes me sad when I see people falling for this stuff. And I said to you, it's only Jesus. That's it. Full stop. There's not Jesus plus having a talit. Jesus plus praying on a mat. It's Jesus plus growing a beard. It's Jesus Christ. The relationship with him. That's what it's about. All this other stuff. And they're all guilty. I'm using the Jewish one because it's very relevant today. But the Pentecostals got a lot of stuff. And the, they all got stuff that they bring in. And we need to know. You must be at that place in your life where you are in love with the Lord. And that's it for you. You don't need anything else but the Lord. Because if you're in love with your wife and your husband, that's all you need. If you're in love with the Lord, that's all you need. You don't need, need the other stuff. You don't need the other woman. You only need Him who's already inside of you. Who says he loves you, you are fair to his beloved. And next week we're going to continue with this topic. I want to take it deeper, but I want you to see why you must be a virgin. Why you mustn't be defiled by religion so easily. That's why I say with a woman doing all the stuff they do with the things, it's all religious exercises, little things that you do. And it's fine, there's nothing wrong with doing it. But if you don't watch it, you're getting impregnated with religion. Same as listening to teachings, it's wrong. Sharing these verses. I mean, most of the time when my mom comes to our house, both of them, we have to clean their phones because they're full. Ask Monique and Kayla myself. And they're full of one thing only. Little pictures with verses on them. Little clips with a guy saying, Jesus loves you, whatever the case may be. Their phones are full of it. They live on that. And unfortunately, if you live on a little thing that somebody's sending you, man, you're not, then where's Jesus in this picture? Do you see what I'm saying? Nothing wrong with this stuff. It's what, what are you worshipping? Who can't you be without? Without a verse, getting a verse from your friends today? Or Jesus Christ? So, please, it's only Him and Him alone. He calls you His beloved. He's in love with your soul, the way He made you. Stop criticizing your soul. Allow him to cleanse it, to purify your soul. Because that's what he's coming for. And he wants to marry that, that virgin, that pure virgin that is not interested in religion. She's not sleeping around with religion. Today she climbs in bed with this church. Next week she climbs in bed with that church. She's only sold out for a bridegroom. Alright, you get that.